come to the time that we have a talk by Bill. Uh, all of you have a, in your uh, the program a summary of Bill's history. One doesn't have to go over it in, in great detail. Um, but it's interesting to ask about this long scientific journey that Bill has taken. Uh, when he left Harvard and went to Chicago to work with Stuart Rice, he worked on radiationless transitions in gases. And uh, then he went off uh, to uh, do some postdoctoral work. He went to, to France, where he worked on molecular spectroscopy of gases. And then he came back, went to Berkeley as a Miller Fellow, where he was working on gaseous molecular spectroscopy. And uh, when he came to UCLA in 1975, we were talking, uh, he was doing some work then interested in slightly different kind of area, looking at uh, collision-induced light scattering and something that interested me at the time. But uh, as I said at the start with Avi's talk, in uh, 1980 when Avi was here, there was this phase transition Bill went from working on gases and molecular spectroscopy. Uh, he went working to self-assembly, working on liquid crystals, micelles, membranes, and uh, this is a remarkable change. And then in around 2000, uh, another transition occurred, and the transition occurred to working on viruses. And as you'll hear today, it's gone from working on the physical aspects of viruses to really biological, medical aspects of viruses. So how do you do that? How do you get from working on gases and follow a traje trajectory uh, through in many different areas? Well, first, you have to have guts. <laughs> uh, Bill is uh, fearless. If you walk down the street with Bill, and there's a flight of steps, he will try to jump over them. <laughs> he, if there's a wall, he'll jump over the wall. And he makes it most of the time. <laughs> so he's fearless in, in that way. He also has a deep general knowledge. And all of his work is characterized by being uh, elegant, uh, insightful, and very original. Now, you also have to be very uh, fearless if you decide to work on viruses when the last biology course you had was the one you had in high school and it was given by the football coach. <laughs> <laughs> it was actually called sex education. It wasn't <laughs> biology. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you also have to convince people to work along with you and to work uh, with a group of faculty who are willing to teach you, as, we, as Bill has learned. Um, he and I went to a, uh, a course a, a, in, at uh, Smith College. It was a boot camp to learn about using molecular biology techniques in the laboratory. Uh, we were lab partners, and we were the worst partners in the group. <laughs> <laughs> So as a result, Chuck, uh, we, we were good partners. We just didn't do a good job with the experiment. <laughs> <laughs> and and, and as, a re, as a result, uh, Bill has found, as I have found, that the best way to do the direct the research in the laboratory is to stay out of the lab. <laughs> and uh, it is helpful also to have very good graduate students and colleagues. So uh, Bill, uh, the time is getting on. I'll ask you to come up and talk. Obviously, this is a very special occasion. Um, a day when you are with friends and when you hear friends talking about viruses is a good day. And when you get to say a few words yourself, even better. Um, I'll say a few personal words uh, this evening uh, without slides. 
at the banquet, uh, I want to tell you a story. Uh, basically, I'll be telling you uh, why we're so excited about the possibility that there's no better way to deliver genes than in the form of a self-replicating RNA molecule, and that there's no better way to protect that genetic information than in a viral capsid. So in a sense, the, the story spans the 15 years that we've been uh, working on viruses, but I will present results from the uh, last year or two before I finish, uh, especially including, uh, Chuck referred to the fact that uh, we're working on uh, translational uh, uh, medicine problems, which are a direct consequence of what we've learned about the physical properties of RNA and viral capsid proteins. I have a subtitle for my talk, and uh, you see it there. Uh, I'm not doing theoretical work any longer, but I'm still a theorist. Uh, it's how I think. It's what I know how to do. And one of the lessons uh, I learned is that, especially when I moved from small molecules in the gas phase to polymers, uh, and then ultimately to biological systems, is that uh, you always have to find a simple system to understand what you're doing, uh, to understand the problem. So in the back of my mind, I've always been searching for the hydrogen atom of viruses. And I mean it in a very literal sense. Everybody's clear what the hydrogen atom of atoms is. It's the hydrogen atom. <laughs> the hydrogen atom of molecules is the simplest molecule, which has to be you're defining what a molecule is. It's at least one electron and at least two nuclei. So take the two simplest nuclei, protons, and one electron. H2 plus is indeed the molecular orbital basis for understanding uh, molecules in chemistry. What's the hydrogen atom of viruses? You have to define what a virus is. We just defined what a, a molecule is. Uh, it's protected genetic information. So you need a genome and you need protection, which invariably takes the form of a one protein thick shell. Sometimes it's two shells. And I will be talking about uh, one of the viruses we're working on that we feature in our gene delivery systems, which I think is as good a candidate for the hydrogen atom of viruses as any. We've heard about some uh, pretty complicated viruses. Uh, herpes is a complicated virus. It has lots of genes, lots of gene products, many components in its parts list. Influenza, per mix of viruses, uh, they are complicated, even though they only have of order 10 genes. Okay? We saw uh, one of the viruses Hong talked about, MS2. That's a pretty simple virus. Did you note how big its genome is, or rather how small it is? Less than 4,000 nucleotides. That's very few genes. In fact, it's about three genes. You need a gene for replicating the genome. You need a gene for the capsid protein. In that case, you have a maturation protein. For that virus, you need it. But I'm going to talk about a simpler virus where you have a capsid protein and an RNA genome. So a virus can have as few as two genes, and it's useful to think of that, I argue, as the hydrogen atom of viruses. Oops. <laughs> Didn't press hard enough and then press too hard. I got it now. Uh, it was a natural question to ask when we started, can we understand the difference between RNA and DNA viruses by understanding the difference between RNA and DNA? Uh, when I talk about DNA, I'll be talking about double-stranded DNA. It's what you're thinking of. When I talk about RNA, I'll be talking about single-stranded RNA. You might be thinking about double-stranded RNA. Uh,
from a physical point of view, DNA behaves like a stiff linear polymer. It's a heteropolymer, several letters, and the sequence is something our lives depend on. But from a physical point of view, it's a stiff, linear, and charged polymer. And uh, Avi talked about, uh, Hong talked about, how it is strongly confined in viral capsids, namely, to confine it or package it, you need to do a lot of work and build up a lot of pressure. Single-stranded RNA behaves qualitatively differently. It behaves like a flexible branch polymer. It's weakly confined in the sense that you don't have to do work to package it. It's packaged spontaneously when you mix it with capsid protein under the right conditions. So I've just talked about how an RNA gene is a different physical object than a DNA gene. Of course, it's also a different biological object. But the point I want to make here is that RNA, especially if it's positive sense messenger RNA, can be directly translated into proteins. That means that it doesn't need to involve the nucleus of its host cell if it's a viral RNA genome. And that'll turn out to be, I argue, hugely important for using virus-derived virus-like particles to deliver genes. Uh, because you don't need to get in and out of the nucleus, you need far fewer genes. If you're positive sense and you're directly translated, you don't need to carry along reverse transcriptase or an uh, RNA-dependent RNA polymerase. You just get translated and you make the protein you need to copy yourself. Uh, so it is a fact that the genes of the simplest viruses, which number two, three, four, five genes, they're always viruses that have single-stranded RNA genomes with positive sense. Uh, related to that, they can be reconstituted, the viruses, as I already mentioned, uh, in vitro from purified components in a spontaneous process. Uh, and what I want to be emphasizing is that for this reason, they provide the best gene delivery system. We've seen this picture. Uh, Avi showed it, and I think you've seen it in other contexts uh, over the years. It's in textbooks. It's showing you how strongly DNA is confined uh, in its protective shell. I like it for many reasons. Uh, we've mentioned persistence length. Uh, when you have uh, no energy you're putting into the system other than thermal energy, you have a thermally equilibrated DNA molecule in solution, you can go along the DNA or about 50 nanometers before you begin to head in a different direction. Thermal energy is enough to start bending the DNA on that length scale, but not a shorter one. You can see that 50 nanometers right here. You will never see the DNA bent into a radius smaller than 50 nanometers. So this picture tells you the persistence length of DNA. And this is about 20 microns of DNA. And you can see that, too, because this is about a micron and a quick estimate, like guessing how many jelly beans in a jar, you'd guess about tens of microns here. OK. And because this length is orders of magnitude larger than the size of the capsid, and even the persistence length is bigger than the radius of the capsid, you have to strongly bend. It takes a lot of energy to do that. And crowd upon itself a strongly self-repelling uh, polymer. And uh, indeed, we, we estimated that uh, tens of thousands of times uh, thermal energy is needed to package this genome in that small volume. And it corresponds to building up uh, tens of atmospheres of pressure. I do want to describe the experiment that uh, was our first. Uh, uh, and that uh, 
work the first and every other time, unlike any other experiment we've done. And I'll bet that anybody doing biology experiments can say things didn't work the first time, and then when they did work, they didn't work again for a while. <laughs> yes. um, we take the purified virus. It happened to be uh, lambda, a bacteriophage. Um, it was so well characterized in every other way uh, that we thought we would try to establish this virus as a pressurized virus with the following experiment. Purified virus. Um, we have an osmolite in solution. Avi referred to the fact that you can control the osmotic pressure in your buffer solution by adding a high enough molecular weight polymer so that it's excluded from inside and it's literally sucking water out of the uh, capsid. Um, and in that sense, uh, you're creating a pressure outside that's greater than inside. Um, but of course, the DNA is confined inside. It's an osmolite on the other side of the semi-permeable rigid membrane. So it's sucking water in the way an osmolite does. And you don't need a balance of pressure. You have zero osmotic pressure here. The activity of uh, water here, uh, you've come to osmotic equilibrium, but it's not really osmotic equilibrium because you have a stopper here. The capsid's closed, and you have a high pressure that we'd like to measure inside, and no pressure outside. We add the osmolite. We add the purified receptor that normally this virus binds to. It triggers ejection, and the ejection will proceed until the pressure inside has dropped to whatever the pressure outside is. And then we ask, how high a pressure do we need so that there's no ejection at all, even when you open the capsid. And uh, after adding the receptor, we add uh, DNAs to digest any ejected DNA. We spin down the sample. The digested DNA stays in the uh, supernatant, along with the osmolite. And the unejected DNA uh, is in the pellet. And then we can extract the DNA and see how much stayed inside. Or we can just do UV absorbance uh, of the ejected DNA to see how much was ejected. And of course, they are consistent with one another. And uh, Avi showed this plot. Here's more da data. You can use several experiments to show that when you have no pressure outside, you have complete ejection. When you have 